Father in heaven, I thank you for the gorgeous day you've given us. I thank you for each one here, not only uh, them as my friends, but the soul they are deep down inside, and that's one thing we're going to see tonight. I thank you for those that are watching online later. Father, give us courage and excitement and also uh, a renewed responsibility and hope to, to share uh, the truth about everlasting life through Jesus. Father, give us uh, an ability to ask questions, let our hearts be encouraged, and admit uh, times when we don't know, and, and go to your word and trust you more. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, like I said, I'm thankful you're here. I'm proud, proud of you. Why does this matter so much? And there's going to be some per participation tonight, but why does the conversation about what happens when we die, why does it matter? Because we don't know. We, because often we don't know. Generally just, we don't know, yeah. and it's probably the one big thing looming. Yeah. yeah. We don't know. Um, and also, the other thing we talked about is it affects all of us. It, it really does. What On the sheet that you have, what we're going to be doing at times is... We're going to be covering, in large part, all the ones that are highlighted. The ones that aren't highlighted are just extra material for you to read to encourage your heart. But the ones that are highlighted, we will be looking at and uh, uncovering some of it. Um, some of it we will not uncover completely. If they are in red, these are the words of Jesus. Some of you might have already figured that out. But the red letters are the words of Jesus. Um, but the, the very first top of that page is kind of the thesis for the sermon on Sunday. What we believe about what happens when we die will greatly impact how we live. Okay? Let that go into your heart. And I think that's one of the reasons we're here tonight is because what we believe, what we know about the future of eternity should impact how we live today. Um, a scripture that we shared Sunday is this, that first scripture on that page, Ecclesiastes 3. says, He, or God has put eternity into man's heart. Yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. It's just what you were talking about. This matters, and yet we don't know. I fully don't understand every, how every, everything God made it. I believe he created things, uh, and he was before. He will be here always. But I don't know how things are going to end up. But we do know a lot of things that we can encourage um, each other with tonight. But from beginning to end, we don't know everything. Um, but God speaks a lot about it. This is probably, these two pages here, are just a small portion of what God's Word talks about eternity or after we die. So know that there's a lot more to study, but these are some of the things that are really encouraging. Someday I mentioned, um, for most of us though, and I hope you can recall this if you were here Sunday a little bit. For most of us, we have identified at least one way that we don't want to die. I don't know if you guys, if that came to your mind, hey, I don't want to go this way. Um, strangely enough, the top 10 list and uh, the top 10 of people don't want to die falling or drowning. So Tiffany has kind of combined the two. She doesn't want to fall off a bridge and drown when it collapses. So that's just her. That's my wife. And then I shared that for me it was I don't want to be poisoned. I know that's a little strange. At your table, though, this is a little bit of involvement. I'm going to check on how everybody's doing in just a minute. you got one minute to share your name in one way that you don't want to go. So you just got one minute, guy. Will we know each other in heaven? I think the answer is yes. I think we will uh, have actually better relationships in heaven than we ever had on earth. And, and I want to encourage you with this. Um, our relationships in heaven are going to be amazing but different. Uh, one reason I think we're going to recognize and know each other in heaven is when Jesus raised from the dead, they recognized Jesus. He was the same but different. They could touch, Thomas, remember, touched even his uh, holes in his hand. And uh, yet, though, he passed through walls. So he had a body. They recognized him, but he was different. So that's one thing. In Luke chapter 16, you see that big first uh, section in your page. This is a story that Jesus tells. Some people say it's a parable. Parables are often those stories that are kind of imaginary to prove a point. This may be a parable that actually happened. And that's debatable. But you can look through there. It's about the rich man and Lazarus. And they're in eternity. They're after death. And they know each other. They, they, they recognize. They have memories of, uh, in fact, this rich man who died that went to the place of torment. Once 
someone to go back to tell his brothers to believe the prophets. And then you can see at the end, Jesus says, if they didn't believe the prophets, why would they even believe someone who has risen from the dead? And um, you're like, well, everyone would believe someone who risen, rose from the dead. And yet Jesus is foretelling people will not believe in him. But what we see is here relational awareness. They recognize each other. And this is a, a story of Jesus about the afterlife. Um, in Revelation 4, you might write this down. It's not even all your, all your uh, words here. In Revelation 4, John recognizes the 24 elders. Now, we don't know them by name, but John realizes who they are. So he's seeing a glimpse of heaven, and he recognizes these men as, as elders. And so there's a lot of scriptural reference of people knowing who people were in heaven. My favorite one of this to answer this question is on the bottom of the first page in yellow highlight. In 1 Corinthians 13, 12, look what it says. Paul is talking about what's going to happen after, after death. He says, now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. He goes, things are blurry, not very clear. But when, but then, he's talking about in the future, in heaven, we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete. Just what we were talking about from the beginning. We don't know. But then I will know everything completely, just as God has just as God now knows me completely. So here's the promise of heaven. As well as you're known by God, now we're going to know others to that completion in heaven. Uh, it's this concept. It's really kind of a, a buzzword right now. It's a longing for relationships, for friends, or for spouses to be fully known and fully loved. Anybody ever heard that phrase before, fully known and fully loved? In heaven, that's the way it's going to be. I will tell you, I have an amazing relationship with my wife, but we are not fully known and fully loved yet. But in heaven, our relationships are going to be that full. We're going to know each other in everything as God knows us completely now. And that's, that's, a, that's a great encouragement to me. Um, any questions that? Right now, we've probably got time for a question on each of these, and we may have to speed up later. But based on this idea... Will we know each other in heaven? I think yes, based on those truths. What comes to mind when you think of that? Well, are we going to know them as, there's my dad. There's, you know, there's my yeah. husband. Well, I think so. I go back to the parable that Jesus said. Will you go tell my brothers? Remember? he's in. He, this guy's in Hades, though, or the punishment place. And he's like, I, I want you to help my brothers who maybe had to help. So I think I think we will know people as brothers, sisters, friends, co-workers, neighbors. Yeah. And I base that on that parable. Yeah. Uh, one of the passages in the scripture that, that always has given me hope about recognizing people was in the transfiguration. The disciples recognized Moses and Elijah. Amen. And Moses lived 4,000 years before Elijah about two. Well, you know how they did that. They had name tags on. You know? <laughs> no, that's a great point. That is a great point. If you didn't hear that and the Mount of Transfigurations, the inner circle knew who they were visited by. And they named, I mean, it was obvious to them. And that may be a glimpse of fully known. Because if, if, if you hadn't known that person and they were just from the nation across the, you know, across the river, you wouldn't have had a clue. But they knew. Good point. Let's move on. This is probably number two of all the questions I was asked on social media or private email. Will my pet be in heaven? I'm serious. So it's just, it's a real question. It's, it's meaningful. Uh, scriptures speak more to this than you might think. According to Second Opinion 2, uh, it reads that all pets will be in heaven except for cats. That's what it says. <laughs> that came from Daryl. Yeah. That came from Daryl. <laughs> but uh, that's not true. In, in scripture, man, we see a lot of reference to script, uh, pets. Not pets, but animals. Um, there's a lot of places that we see glimpses that God values animals in his creation. However, they do not have souls. They are valuable, though, maybe for our enjoyment. I'm not sure why. Think about the Garden of Eden, though, the first paradise when things were perfect. There was no sin. God had set that up to be that way in relationship with him forever. And guess what was there? A lot of animals. A lot of animals. Um, I'm not sure if they were kind of like pets as we know them. 
Um, but then also, look at the second page of your notes to Isaiah chapter 11. It's on the top of the second page. We can turn it over. Isaiah 11, 6 through 9. This is an amazing passage. Look what it says. In that day, Isaiah's talking about when everything is made new. This is in the Old Testament even. In that day, the wolf and the lamb will live together. The leopard will lie down with the baby goat. The calf and the yearling will be safe with the lion. And the little child will lead them all. The cow will graze near the bear. The cub and calf will lie down together. The lion will eat hay like a cow. The baby will play safely near the hole of a cobra. Yes, little children put their hand in the nest of a deadly snake without harm. Nothing will hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For as the waters fill the sea, so the earth will be filled with people who know the Lord. There's a lot of details there that I'm not completely sure of. But what I see there is harmony and perfection. Like the first Garden of Eden. Like the first paradise. I still don't know because I hate snakes so much why a baby would stick their hand in a cobra's nest. But there's going to be a day where God makes all things new. And we see here from Isaiah that he's got this vision that it will include animals. I don't know if it's your pet. Uh, but what I do know is God loves us so much that if he desires to bless us with something that uh, gives us great joy, he can do it through pets if he desires. And uh, here's what I would also say, though. It's not for the sake of the pet. It'll be for the sake of your blessing and and you to live in glory giving to God. So you may be like, God, I'm so thankful for these, these awesome animals here. Praise you, praise you, praise you. Um, it's possible. But it's honestly is so much less importance than you being there. Amen. You and our friends being there and your children and grandchildren being there are so much more important. But I think there's going to be awesome animals in heaven. Um. I will give you a little bit, though, of my flawed perspective. Whenever I was 10 through 13, I thought heaven was primarily going to be a dirt bike race. I thought heaven was just <laughs> dirt bikes. However, if God so chooses to allow me to ride the dirt bike I've always wanted in heaven for a couple days, give him glory for it. So it's probably not going to be there, though, because we're going to be so amazed by God. We won't need any of those other things that used to really attract us. Any questions about that, about will our pets be in heaven? Does that make a little sense about what we know? Okay. The next question that I uh, got written down that came from many of you. How long before we have new bodies in heaven? So this question came a lot of different ways. Like what's the timeline for when you die to when we go to heaven to when we get in our house? But I really summarized it a specific way that I think with scriptures can help us understand this. How long do, until we have new bodies? So Sunday we covered we're going to get new bodies, spiritual bodies. And they're going to be perfect. Uh, our bodies now are perishable. They're going to be imperishable. Our bodies now are weak. They're going to be strong. Our bodies now are failing, but these are going to be glorious. How long do we get that? Um, here's the first thing we have to realize. When you die, we talked about this Sunday, and this happens for everyone. Your body will be laid to rest or lost or burned or consumed or just buried. Your body will stop and be here and your spirit, your soul will go on. So there is a time, based on what I see in scripture, that our bodies will separate, excuse me, our soul will separate from our bodies and we'll be with Jesus. Um, look to Ecclesiastes 12 on your paper, the, the second page there, the second highlighted text, it says this. And the dust returns to the earth as it was. You know, we're created from dust. And the spirit returns to God who gave it. So your, your spirit, your soul, separates from your body immediately. That's why Paul says, the next verse in the middle of that page, 2 Corinthians 5, Yes, we are for good courage. He says, be encouraged by this, that we would rather be away from the body and home with the Lord. There's that basic home run principle that to be absent from this body means we would be with Jesus without a body though for a time I really think and we're going to see in a little bit there'll be a time where you're just your soul and you're with Jesus and that's okay I don't know that for sure I could be just as wrong about that as I'm about dirt bikes okay but 
we're going to see there's a time when our, our spiritual bodies are made. Um, we have to understand this, though. Our bodies are fading, and, and I know we can easily understand we're going to let them all go sometime. But I want you to think about this for a second. You don't have a soul. You are a soul. And you have a body. I'll say it again. You don't have a soul. You are a soul. That's who you are. Your identity is made in God's image and that's your soul. We've been given an earthly body and we have it for a time, but it's going to fade. But what you have forever, from the moment you're conceived to the till eternity, whether you live in heaven or live in hell, your soul is going to exist forever. So you are a soul and you have a body now and it's going to die. Um, our bodies are fading. We, we understand that. So when do we get this new body? Um, there are a couple different theories of that, but what I am resting on most, where I have the most peace now, when Jesus makes everything new, he's going to make a new heaven. In Revelation, we see a new earth, and our new bodies are in that time as well. I think we're going to have a new, Jesus is going to create the new heaven, new earth, and at, at that point, we're going to have new bodies. Um, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, still on the second page. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made by with hands, eternal in heaven. So the next body we have, made by God, is going to be eternal. And this body will fade away. So that's not anything new. Uh, Paul gives us a good look at what this looks like. Not actually what our bodies look like, but what this day is going to look like. Look with me. To that bigger uh, portion of scripture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. On the bottom of the second page. Uh, and it tells us kind of the timeline maybe of these bodies being resurrected. It says this. Paul says, we do not want you to be uninformed. Brothers. He also is talking to, just, he's talking to the believers at the time. But those who are asleep that you may not, uh, excuse me. We don't want you to be uninformed about those who are asleep. That you may not grieve. As others who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by the word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. So pause right here for a second. Right now, if Jesus were to return, we're not going to precede those who have passed on before us. But look, what he, here's how he explains what will happen. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the, cry of, with the cry of command and the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. I believe at that time is when they're going to rise with their new body because they're already with him in spirit as soon as they die. Now, this is debatable, but this is this really what gives me peace based on the whole uh, wealth of Scripture. There's going to be a time where the dead in Christ rise and we're going to see what happens then. Then those who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. People who have no hope, who don't know Jesus, they're overwhelmed when people die. Paul says, I want you to know that there will be a day where we gather again with those who went on before us. There's another thought of being with people forever. Um, so it's a beautiful just picture of what it looks like to have these new bodies and uh, we'll be together in the sky. Uh, flip over to the next page, page 3, and we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 15. Paul gives us a little bit of a description of the body, what, it, what it's going to be like, not by looks, but by its qualities. He says, The body that is sown is perishable. But what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, but is raised in power. It is sown as a natural body, it is raised as a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So there will be a day where these new spiritual bodies of those that have already died rise just before us, and then we're going to meet them in the sky. But I do believe they are not in sleep. In slumber, and they might be, you know, so I'm being unclear here, I know. But uh, the Bible says there is not really a time of waiting. To be absent from this body is to be with the Lord for them. Um, there's, we're going to speak to that a little bit more in a minute. So these bodies will rise. 
If our bodies will be risen, let me just ask you this then. What do you think about cremation? Now, no offense if we get a little bit disgusting and maybe even a little bit argumentative here. People have opinions on cremation. If our spiritual bodies have to rise, is cremation uh, possible? Yeah, I agree. I, and and I, I don't, I don't um, want uh, an argument here. 10, 20, no, let's go back. 20, 30 years ago, I was taught that cremation was really for heathens. That's what I grew up in Southern Indiana for whatever. Nobody got cremated. And people would say, well, why would we cremate a body that needed to be risen? Guys, what happens to a body after 10, 20, 100 years? It goes back to dust anyways. It decays. By the way, I'll just this is a tidbit that really changed my heart. It's not that much rocket science. My uncle was burned in a bad industrial fire. Can God raise his body being destroyed in that fire? Yes. Can God raise a body that's been consumed by a shark? Yes. So he can raise anybody um, that he uh, deems as his child. So with that said, cremation is legitimate. It's actually, I would say, uh, very um, logical based on certain situations. So, but there's opinions. Uh, I think Tiffany is strongly against cremation. So if I die before her, I'll probably not be cremated. If she dies first, maybe she'll be cremated. I don't know. <laughs> you know, it won't matter. It won't matter, will it? It won't matter because we're both going to be raised. So where am I at now? Uh, this all stands a little bit. This all seems a little bit strange. So it goes back to the question: How long do we have to wait? How long do we have to wait for a new body? Well, based on this concept, we really have to wait till the second coming of Jesus. So, in essence, based on this theory, if our soul is going to be with Jesus immediately, all of our loved ones and friends that passed on before us are waiting? In some way, yes. But I want you to see this, what Peter says. Look at your paper in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. In the middle, the second part of that uh, third page. He says, do not overlook this one fact. If you're starting to worry, don't overlook this one fact. My friends, beloved, that, the, that with the Lord one day is a, like a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. So what, what Peter's reminding us, we get caught up in how intense eternity feels and how long we're going to have to wait. It's like potentially a blink of an eye for those that have passed on before us. If one day is like a thousand years and somebody's been dead ten years, man, they're just talking a few moments. And, the, and all of a sudden, we're there together. I also, off the books, uh, outside of the big picture of the Bible that I can't support, I really think those that passed on before us are not in stress about waiting at all. I think it's like a blink of an eye because with them, time ceases to matter like it matters to us. So that's all I have to say about that one. Um, so with the question of how long is it going to be until we get our new bodies? You guys have any thoughts or questions? God doesn't know time. <coughs> the Spirit of God doesn't know time. He's just, he's beyond it. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a blink of an eye. Yeah. I think he's very aware that we know time, and he he, right. he covers that for us on the other side of eternity. So that, that I totally, that affirms what I'm, how I sleep well at night <laughs> with that. That's true. Don't overlook that. Remember that. For God, uh, time is just different. Okay, so here's the next one. Will we be married in heaven? So before we get into this a little bit, remember, I believe in Scripture, we're going to know each other greater than we ever have known each other on earth. Um, I think our relationships are going to be more than we can imagine now, even if you think you have a perfect relationship with your spouse. If you think you're... Spouse is absolutely perfect. God bless me with the perfect spouse. I want to be married with them in heaven because we have a perfect relationship. Who are you kidding? You are not. Your spouse may be perfect, but you're not. Okay? What's the reality is, it's going to be better than we have ever had here. And Jesus speaks directly to this. Look at the next verse that's highlighted. Matthew 22, 29, and then verse 33. Um... We don't have to speculate about this. Look what Jesus says. Well, let me give you a little background. There was these 
great teachers of the law that were trying to trip Jesus up and were saying things like, well, what if a guy was married and then he died and then his brother married that woman and another brother married the same woman. They're all trying to bless her with family, with resources. What happens then in heaven whenever uh, they're all there together? And this is what Jesus says. You are an heir. And he's like, you're wrong. Because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. When the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. This may be the thing that bothers you the most of anything the Bible says. But what Jesus is saying, if we get caught up in the fact that we're married and have an inbound to that marriage, we don't really understand that God is beyond anything we know now. We don't understand the power of God. We don't understand the blessing of relationship in God perfectly. Marriage is extremely important. It's only second to our relationship with God here on earth. But God is saying through Jesus here that in heaven we're not going to be bound or given to marriage. And if that makes you a little sad, I, I, I do understand that. And um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't expect you to be happy about that because you love your spouse so much. Um, but it's, it's what the Word of God says. Jesus is clear about this. We're not given to marriage. Um, as great as your marriage may be, once we get to heaven, I don't think anyone will say, anyone will say at any even one point. Here, here's here's why I really reconcile this. I don't think Tiff and I will look at each other after 60 years of marriage and when we get to heaven and say, we're not married now and I sure miss the good old days. I don't think anyone will long for the good old days of earth. Because... <coughs> A lifetime of a perfect marriage on earth will pale in comparison to one moment in heaven. This is what I think Scripture is trying to tell us. It's just that much better. I do think we'll remember those relationships and value them, but God's going to give us so much more. Um, you might say, well, I want to be with my loved one. They've already passed on. And I, know some, I, I just look around the room right now and I realize that's true. There are people who've lost spouses and children and parents, a lot of us. Um, and we want to be with those loved ones, especially spouses. And, and that's because we don't know the blessing of heaven yet. It's understandable. I, I pray that you will forever long to see them again and you will see them again. Be very careful, though, because this is becoming more and more popular. This may be the most important thing I say tonight. Be very careful that you're not tempted to pursue them after they're dead while you're on earth. Um, there are ways that the world tells us to do that. I think through the power of Satan, through like mediums and seances, not like small, medium and large, but mediums. They are like, uh, you know, spiritualist, like our fortune teller or uh, maybe a Ouija board. That is very dangerous. Look to the next verse and you're like, Tyson, why are you, why are you talking about this so much? Look what it says here in Leviticus 19.31. Do not look for advice from people who get messages from those who have died. Do not go to people who talk to the spirits of the dead. If you do, they will make you, excuse me, if you do, they will make you unclean. I'm the Lord your God. God is just giving us clear direction here that when we're talking to the afterlife and pursuing them through people who say they have that gift, it is through unclean powers. Um, you might say, though, I have felt the presence of my loved one and maybe felt even a, a word of encouragement from them or maybe I've gotten a sense of advice from them. That's very possible, but don't pursue it. If it happens, be thankful for it and then move on. Don't live in it. Don't celebrate it. Don't long for it again. Don't go back to that place and pay money for it or make a sacrifice. These all things, things happen today, and they are connected to evil. Okay, so that's pretty intense. Notice at the end of that verse where it says, don't con contact these people. Uh, they'll make you unclean. They'll make you, it's dirty, it's evil. God ends with saying, I'm the Lord your God. He says, seek me. While I know you love your husband or wife, they're gone, or your children, or your grandma or grandpa, or your dad, mom, you'll see them again. Seek me now. Okay? That's that question about... Will he be married in heaven? 
And the answer is no. It's going to be better than that. What 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 questions or thoughts come to your mind about that question? Yes, Diana. Don't you think that people long so much for those relationships that that's why they seek that out? But God warns us against that because He's a selfish God. He wants us to long for Him. And He knows that that's where true blessing comes from. Amen. He does. He does desire to have us put him first. And what's amazing, when we put him first, your second, third place relationships will be better than they ever could if they, if you put them first. And he knows that. He's selfish. And he's also giving at the same time. Good. If you've ever been to premarital counseling, which I know some of you had with me, we talk a lot about God first and your spouse second. And your relationship with your spouse goes higher than they ever could if you put them first. Because you're... You're going to put them in the eyes of God and treat them as a, as more than just a spouse. What are the questions? So one more, yeah. My mom was into genealogy and she found out that my great grandfather had seven wives. Okay. So he might be busy. You know. <laughs> yeah. He's going to have a lot of relational connections. And praise God for him. He doesn't have to uh, honor all them perfectly, right? Yeah. God will. That's good. That's good. Um, here's the next question. It was only asked by a couple people, but it may be the most intense. Can someone who commits suicide go to heaven? Many of you know someone who's committed suicide. Um, I've done funerals for people who have committed suicide. We all have known probably someone that killed themselves. So the question is, does committing suicide become an automatic and ultimate barrier for God to say, no, you cannot enter my heaven? Just let that sink in for just a moment. It, that's really what we're saying. When we take our own life, does God, does, does the scripture say that that is an automatic, you're out? I don't think so. And it doesn't. Um, suicide is not the unpartable sin. It's not the, the sin that uh, has an absolute condemnation to hell. Um, there is, in that point, still hope. Um, at the same time, I need everyone to hear this because I, I don't know what anybody's thinking. Suicide is never the answer. It's just not. Even though there still can be hope within suicide, um, we never see it being shown as the answer. There's never... Uh, something really a blessing that comes from it. Suicide is really taking the pain that you have from the world and saying, I don't want any more and then giving to all of your loved ones. And it's not the answer. Uh, but there is hope, I believe. Uh, from what I understand, there are at least seven people in the Bible that committed suicide. And not once does the Bible tell that story and then say those people are in hell be absolutely because they killed themselves. Um, it is always very painful and there's, it's very dark, but it does not, it, the Bible just never says suicide equals condemnation automatically. You might say, well, what about Judas who betrayed Jesus and then committed suicide? Isn't he in hell? One of his own disciples took money to have Jesus crucified and then killed himself. He's got to be in hell. Here's what I know. If Judas is in hell, it isn't because he killed himself. It's because he rejected Jesus. So I hate that for Judas, anyone who knew Judas. But the reason Judas would be in hell isn't because of how he died. It's because he rejected Jesus. Um, it's, it's, really, it's really serious. Um, here's one thing. We never know the mental state or the spiritual state of someone when they make that choice. We just don't. But suicide is never the answer. And if, if you know someone who's thinking about suicide or maybe you thought about it and it could happen to you a year from now again, know there's always hope. Um, there's people always going to be here. I may not always be here available, but there's people in this community of the church uh, that would always be willing to talk to you. And I would love to talk to you if you ever have a, a dark moment or your friend has a dark moment. Um, but there's always hope. And the person... That or the spiritual power that is the most behind suicide is the devil. The Bible says, Jesus says, in fact, in John 10, 10, 
The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And suicide is one of the most prolific or efficient ways for him to kill, steal, and destroy. So we have to speak against it and know it's not the answer. There's always hope. But even in suicide, I believe God gives grace and room for hope if they haven't rejected Jesus. Now, some would maybe say, well, if you've committed suicide, you're rejecting Jesus because he's the author of life. I don't know a person's heart. Um, so it's very serious. So can someone who commits suicide go to heaven? I think the answer is through God's grace, yes. I think that's why we have to be very honest and open about it. If you're thinking about it, though, it is never the answer. Because if you got to that point, you've thought about it a lot. You may have said, God, I'm walking away from your plan. And then you may have rejected Jesus. So it's, it's really dangerous. With that high level question and topic, any thoughts or questions? The world is going to say suicide is the way out. It's not the answer. Um, next question. Who actually goes to hell? I, I, you know, don't point fingers at anyone. Uh, <laughs> and don't say anything personal. But based on a principle, who goes to hell? Anybody know? On principles, on, on like, who goes to hell? Unbelievers. Okay, yeah, unbelievers. That would be one way to quantify it, yeah. Murderers. Okay. Not all murderers, though. Well, uh, okay. Well, when I said that, yeah. like, I thought you were saying, like, who do society think? Who okay, society okay. Think? Yeah. So, as a principle of what the Bible says, who goes to hell? Unbelievers. Yes. So, um, and the Bible does list a lot of things, including murders that won't inherit the kingdom of God because their hearts are so hard. But there are going to be, and, and you know this, there are going to be murderers and uh, prostitutes, tax collectors, homosexuals, every kind of sinner, if they've been forgiven and become a believer, have a chance for heaven. So who goes to hell? You. Oh, she just said you. That's great. <laughs> Shut up. Uh, uh, let's see. Unrepent would be a truth. Unforgiven. God doesn't send people to hell, but people who reject God choose to go where he's not. And that's what hell is. The worst part about hell is God's not there. The worst part about hell is Jesus is not there. Sunday we talked about this. The best part about heaven is we're to go to be with Jesus forever. He says, I'm going to build you a mansion. The streets are going to be of gold. The, the doors are going to be like pearl gates. But the best part is you're with me. The worst part about hell is we're not with him. Um, and the reason we end up going there, I think, as much as anything, is our hearts become hard. So hard that we reject God. I want to get to this before I forget. The unpardonable sin, the sin that cannot be forgiven, there is one. Anybody know what it is, the sin that can't be forgiven? Yes. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is exactly right. Yeah. And what that literally means is... You would have such a hard heart against the Holy Spirit and God's call and draw to you that you not only would deny it, but you would speak bad against it. And you would declare, I have nothing to do with God. And this is even dangerous to say, I'm just doing an example. I have nothing to do with you, Holy Spirit. And then you would almost curse and reject it. And when the heart is ready for that, you can't come back from that because who calls you to God? The Holy Spirit. And so when you're not listening or responding to the Holy Spirit, you cannot come back from that. You may be thinking, oh shoot, have I ever done that? If you're, if you're worried about it, here's the good news, you haven't. If you're concerned that maybe you went too far and you're scared, you haven't. So respond to that, that concern and that um, draw and say, Jesus, I accept you, the Holy Spirit, live in my life. So if you ever meet somebody though that is totally dead to the Holy Spirit, it's a very, very eternal place to be. I can count on one hand the people I've met that have been that evil to denounce the Holy Spirit and God's power. Um, and if that's true, if they're really meaning that, it's not just a, a show, they're gone forever. But I mean, you don't see that very often. So if you're concerned at all that a friend has done that and they sometimes wonder about and want you to pray for them, they haven't done it. Okay. Um, but the hard heart is what causes that. 
We talked Sunday about Revelation 20. I think you can turn your paper over. Uh, the, the back page, the very first highlighted portion there. How we end up in hell is primarily because of deception of the devil. The devil deceives us and gets our eyes off of Jesus, gets us not listening to the Holy Spirit, allows us to establish something more important than God, and then all of a sudden it's a, it's a slow fade. Look what it says here in Revelation 20. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown in the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the fa false prophet were. And they were tormented day after, uh, excuse me, tormented day and night forever and ever. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, this would have been through Jesus, he was thrown in the lake of fire. So, what happens is, there's a point where if we're deceived by Satan, we follow him and his deception. Uh, right now, Satan is roaming around the earth seeking who he can devour. I think he's no, he knows his time is short, so he's un, uh, amping up his game. I don't know how much time he has, but he knows he has limited time. And he wants to take as many with him as he can. There'll be a day where that's all confined to hell. But now it's still very real and loose. Um, those who have been deceived, who have not received Jesus, will go to hell. So those are the non-repentant, the non-forgiven, the non-empowered by the Holy Spirit. You're given the Holy Spirit on when you're baptized as a deposit securing you for salvation. The Bible says in baptism when we... Uh, confess him and are baptized your sins will be forgiven and you will receive the Holy Spirit and that is a guarantee that you belong to Christ he sees us as perfect because of Christ one last question we got a good amount of time so we're thanks guys for working with us tonight how can I be certain I'm going to heaven that's the last question how how can you be certain that you know and Miss Pat Files is going to come up and share the rest with us <laughs> Pat is right here. Let's give it up for Pat. She's the one who told me Sunday. Hallelujah. So, when she came back tonight, she told me she wouldn't come again, but I'm going to keep going. Um, but really, you can see, you can go 100 different directions, 100 mile an hour with what happens after you die. And I asked Pat, hey, Pat, what comes to your heart when you think about what happens after you die? And she said, right in the hallway by the offices, hallelujah. And just smiled. She's got the right attitude. Amen. I hope each of you have that. How can you have the attitude of Pat File? How can you be certain you're going to heaven? She just said it. Jesus. Jesus. That's right. Trust Jesus. Remember in John 14, Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, many mansions where I can come to take you with me so you may be where I am. Jesus is the way. He, and, then, and then Thomas says, Jesus, how do we know the way? Jesus says, I am the way. I'm the truth and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's Jesus, trusting in Jesus. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus. Um, it is not rocket science. While we don't know how everything started and how everything will end, we know Jesus is the way. And you can go to bed at night with a clear conscience if you trusted in Jesus. Um, I, it's not, it's, it's really children can trust in Jesus. They do, it, they do it maybe better than us adults. I would just encourage you that you might write this down in your heart or on a piece of paper. Really, you can remember this because it's even the ABCs. Now, there's other ways that you can think about this. There's the Roman road. There's um, just the acts of salvation. But sometimes I'm talking to a child, I'll say, think about the ABCs. The A stands for admit. If you want to know that you're forgiven and saved, first you have to admit you need a savior. You have to admit that you're a sinner. So admit that I can't do this on my own. I need to be saved. Uh, I admit that I need Jesus. And in that, when you admit you're a sinner, there is something that's a little harder to remember, and it's important, though. We need to repent of our sin. We don't come to Jesus and say, Jesus, I want you to save me, and I'm going to, by the way, hold on to all my sin. Jesus asks us, the Scriptures ask us time and time again, that we must repent. It says everyone must repent. In fact, if you get baptized before you repent, I suggest you're just getting wet. Might as well just take shampoo and bar soap. 
and stay in there a little longer than you knew to normal baptism. Because if you just go in to get baptized and you've not said, I'm a sinner that needs a savior and I want to change, you're, you're not doing any good. Some of you as adults here tonight may have realized I got baptized and I never repented. I may want, you may want to talk to D or Pat before the night's over or myself or a friend. Um, B, the A is for admit your sinner and you need a savior. The B is believe. Now, somebody said people that don't believe aren't going to heaven. That's true. But belief is just not that it's a belief that Jesus is real. We've got to believe that we can trust him, that he is the savior. Um, James is talking to people who are wanting to be saved. And they're like, James, we believe. And you know what James says? Good. Even the demons believe and they're scared to death because they believed in Jesus, but they didn't trust Jesus. So we've got to believe with an aspect of trust that Jesus is the son of living God, that he died for you. He came back to life and he's coming again. So admit you're a sinner that need a savior. Believe that Jesus is that savior and place your trust in him. The C is confess him with your mouth. We, we, you see this at church all the time when someone comes to give a life to Jesus. Just as important as baptism. And there's elders in the room. And so I'll say this in elders beings too. Off the record, well, it's on record because it's being recorded. <laughs> but our church has last hundred years have made baptism kind of like the pinnacle thing of salvation. If you get baptized and have not confessed or repented, you're just getting left. So baptism does no good then. It is just as important to confess Jesus with your mouth that he's Lord and your Savior than it is to be baptized. It is just as important to be baptized as to repent. These things all go hand in hand. But the C is for confession. And that literally says that your heart believes that Jesus is Lord and you're going to say it. Um, our great confession that we see that Peter said that we take is, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I receive him. I accept him as my Lord and Savior. That is that good, that great confession. If you've never said that, you, you need to do that. Now, in a room like this, it would be pretty easy to do that. Because we're going to be like, oh, that's great. We love you. You know, the church family loves you. We're going to celebrate you. I think God is talking a little bit more in Scripture about what we say at school or our neighbor across the street or at work or the ball field than we are even at church. Because at church, it's easy for me or you to say, I believe in Jesus. But the question is, when your buddy or your girlfriend or a co-worker for years have never known you to be a believer, they can say, I heard you've been going to church. I, I heard that maybe you're following Jesus. At that point is when we're to confess. I believe that Jesus is my Lord. He's my Savior. You do not have to get a Bible out and say, let me show you a hundred scriptures that the pastor gave me and we're going to talk through this. What you need to do is say, yeah, I follow Jesus. Um, Jesus says, if you acknowledge me, he says, if you, if you speak of me before people, I will acknowledge you before the Father. If you deny me before men and people, I will deny you before the Father. It's really important. Confession is important. And then, so it's A, B, C, and what's next in the alphabet? D. 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 Anybody know what D stands for? This is, this is, I made this up on my own. Just get dumped. Get That's right. Become baptized. Be immersed. The D is for dumped. Go under the water. Have your sins washed away. When we get immersed, that's really the word for baptism, it means to totally be plunged into the water. In that, when you go under the water, you share in Christ's death. You talk about death. We talked tonight about what happens when we die physically. You know if you've been baptized, you died spiritually already. Your old self died, and when you come up, you have a new life. You're reborn. So in, in baptism, your old self is crucified with Christ. And in baptism, when you come up, your new self is raised to a new life. So you're actually a new person. What's interesting about that, you heard of double jeopardy. This is you know a thing in our government law system. I think it's a lot like that for spiritual things. When you die with Christ, Satan can no longer kill you again spiritually because you're already dead. You're, you're not, you don't have an ability to be double jeopardized in that way. Now, can you give yourself up to Satan? I think so. But Satan cannot take you away from Jesus once you're reborn with him. Amen? He can't. You're secure. So A is for admit. B is for believe. C is confess. Jesus and D is to be immersed and be dumped. So one other thing I would like to just process with you. What's taking God so long to come back? 
in the form of Jesus. What's he waiting on? You might have an idea what God's waiting on. People. More souls. people to be saved, to answer our prayers. Please. Amen. Amen. Look to the green thing, the green, the green portion of your scripture. You and, you and Pat need to get together and you could have preached this sermon. <laughs> Look what it says. The Lord is not slow. He, he's not behind schedule. He's not. To fill his promise as some count slowness. But is patient towards you, not wanting or not wishing that anyone should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So he's waiting for all to come back to him to repent. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. When we don't know, it's going to come. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. And the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed. You can keep reading there. Those next verses are from that same portion of Scripture. But look down to verse 18. Here's what I would encourage you to do as you go tonight. Keep growing in peace and the knowledge of the Lord, Savior, Jesus. To Him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Keep growing, keep learning, even though we're not going to ever know fully how it started or how it's going to end. Keep growing and give God glory. And it's possible. No one, no power in this earth or under the earth can take you away from Jesus because his love is greater in, in God through what he's done for us on the cross. Um, one day it will happen. You're either going to die or Jesus is going to come back. You belong to him. If you are here tonight and you're like, man, I, I need to do one of those four steps or something else. You, God's calling you through the Holy Spirit. I'd love to talk to you about that. I think this gives you quite a bit of tools to talk to a friend or a family member if they want to know about life and death and about the hope of heaven. So we've got no time left. One question. Anybody have a question? Yes. What if you're not baptized? What if you're not baptized? We can do it tonight. What if someone has passed away and they weren't Oh, baptized? good question. Great question. So there are, just like, and it's not just like this, but there's times we don't know the heart. Um, if we have it all chance, that's why I said we can do it tonight. If you're given half a chance, we should do that. And then the accountability goes way up if you reject that opportunity. There are some people who may never have that opportunity. One example of that, and we'll end with this, is the thief on the cross. That was an extreme case. He did not have the opportunity to be baptized. That was also before baptism was instituted by the church for the forgiveness of sins. But I'm not going to limit God's grace for someone who's fully still has a heart for him. Uh, but if we have even a day with someone that trusts Jesus, we need to help to lead them to be baptized. So there is always hope through forgiveness and grace. Our responsibility is to lead people to trust Jesus and follow him. And that's to baptism. Okay. So, um, and if anybody does want to be baptized tonight, after you've heard, you don't need to hear more than what I just shared. At baptism, though, it's just the starting point; it's not the end. Does that make sense? It's just the journey begins at that point. Um, you're a newborn creation. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for tonight and all these scriptures, even more than we were able to cover, that speak to your grace and your love, but the reality of of judgment for those who reject Jesus and, and bear their sins on their own. We, we cannot do it. We, are, we're, we failed. We've fallen short. But Jesus is more than enough. And I thank you for his sacrifice on the cross. I admit that I'm a sinner saved by grace, and I praise you for that. And I confess Jesus as my Lord, and I'm thankful that I've been made new. Father, if someone here is uh, concerned about any of these things, I pray that they would reach up to you and ask the Holy Spirit to fill them and guide them. And that that we would all be more and more ready for your return and for our passing. In Jesus' name, amen.